The surveillance industry operates by design in a shrouded, opaque manner. They're intentionally making it difficult for the public to understand the vast and intricate network of companies, subsidiaries, partnerships, affiliations, and even the financial backers. There's just a continuation of this growing threat to human rights. This data is just everywhere, and we're willingly just giving it away. And it will fall in the wrong hands. It's not a matter of when, but it's a matter of how often. I really want people to wake up to the reality that this data is being weaponized against absolutely everyone. This is not about paranoia. They're using this data in ways that are just completely unethical and dangerous. You're the creator of the website Surveillance Watch, is that correct? That is correct. Talk to me about this website. I saw it was retweeted by WikiLeaks and Snowden and all of these people who care about privacy. And so I, I took a look and it's really cool. <laughs> it's just a really cool site. So tell me about what this is. So I'm a privacy advocate. By default, this has been my field for the last 20 years. I do human rights advocacy. I build platforms for underrepresented communities in the Swana region, which is Southwest Asia and North Africa. And unfortunately, this means that I am often subject to unwanted surveillance. And I have always really been drawn to this topic. And following so much of this news, I just see every year there's so much sporadic information about surveillance companies, about applications, spyware, and I never really found the one place where I can go to and see who is actually complicit in all of this, because the surveillance industry operates by design in a shrouded, opaque manner. So they're intentionally making it difficult for the public to understand the vast and intricate network of companies, subsidiaries, partnerships, affiliations, and even the financial backers. And this lack of transparency has enabled these entities to profit from technology that infringes on our privacy and basic human rights, often with significant harm to everyday users that are targeted by such technologies. And in my field, being human rights, this includes imprisonment, torture, and even death. So I created this platform because the industry's ability to evade sanctions, to operate transnationally without any accountability often, or insufficient public scrutiny is really part of the reason why there's just a continuation of this growing threat to human rights. And I felt that the public, policymakers, and advocacy groups as a community, we require clear and accessible information about the entities involved in the creation and the distribution and the financial support of surveillance technologies. So this is where Surveillance Watch was born. I feel like we do ourselves a disservice by talking about surveillance in vague terms when we say companies are spying on us, data brokers are scraping the internet, you know, organizations are creating profiles on us. Because without specifics, it's very hard for people to take these abstract concepts and understand the actual threat involved with them. You say that a lot of this is by design. You know, these companies don't want themselves to be known. I did a, a piece that was about Google's real-time bidding a while ago, and I was looking at the approved partners who get this fire hose of information uh, about us from Google. And this is just the approved ones, not the people who then, you know, buy that data from other companies. And I started to look through it and I was just kind of floored at how few of these companies listed had Wikipedia pages, <laughs> had any mm -hmm. information, had any footprint online. And then I read Byron Tao's book where he talks about this four eras of data brokers and dives into specific names. And he's talking about how these are shell companies with shell companies with shell companies that a lot of them trace back to nation states and to government contractors. And it is by design. All of this invasive activity is affecting us, but we have no idea, no transparency into who's behind it. So when I saw your website that actually is putting 
names up there, is putting connections, is putting countries, is putting sources, is putting funding sources. It was incredible. This is such an amazing resource to help people really concretize what's going on. Yes. And it took an insane amount of time for exactly that reason, because we have to also make sure that we legally protect ourselves. So we did actually ask around in terms of how do we make sure that we can build a platform like this and not really be attacked for it from a legal standpoint in terms of these companies coming after us. And really, the a lot of the advice we got was that as long as we're kind of referencing third-party sources, we're really just visualizing existing public data. And that is very important as well, because it's the fact that there has been a lot of incredible reporting about a lot of these tools already, but they tend to just disappear. So much mm -hmm. of these sources, for example, some of them are 10 years old, 15 years old. We had to link to a lot of them from the Wayback Machine. A lot of the companies are also really trying to hide their customer bases. Sometimes you go to a website and you see that maybe five or 10 years ago, they would proudly list the fact that they have been working on government government controlled telecom companies, for example, but so much of this data has disappeared in recent years as increasingly surveillance companies are becoming more and more scrutinized. So that has made it very difficult for us to also maintain a lot of the sources. We actually had to go back and sometimes remove some companies, remove certain data because they're just no longer online and we didn't archive them in a timely manner. So that also makes this type of real-time curation of this data even harder because of the speed at which these companies are simply changing their legal status constantly, changing their ownership, changing the names of the directors, um, and changing whether or not a lot of the financial info is even public. Some of them would go as far as to sue certain companies or certain sources to basically say that this information cannot be shared publicly. And it is a very scary thing because, I mean, you are talking about billionaires, you're talking about very powerful government backers. So it is very risky in that sense, but it is so incredibly important that we have a resource that closes this transparency deficit and amplifies this data globally and in one place and offering a comprehensive resource for those seeking to understand and combat the surveillance industry's influence. So even though it's very difficult and they're making it very difficult to actually be 100% accurate all the time, because so much of this data is just changing literally on a daily basis. So they're making it even harder purposefully, even for journalists and even just for advocates and for policymakers to say that, no, actually this information is outdated and therefore it's not reliable. So I would say that this has been a tremendous challenge in obtaining and now maintaining or growing this database because of this rat race almost that we are up against. Give me an overview of your takeaways, just putting this together, because this is a huge amount of work. I'm scrolling through this list here. There's just countless companies that I've never heard of, but when I you know, click on random ones, the information about them, it floors me. They're well-connected, they're you know, well-funded, they're used all across the globe. I, I mean, were you kind of shocked putting this together? What What's kind of your overview of the surveillance industry and uh, different surveillance states after all of your deep dives into this? I was shocked. I was disturbed. I was disappointed. I shouldn't say that I'm shocked because as I mentioned, I mean, I've been doing this work for so long, but I was shocked at just how invasive that technology has truly become on a completely global scale in a way that has become so normalized that it's even celebrated now when surveillance companies fundraise so much of the resources that we also refer to are press releases saying that we are proud to partner with this and that company which basically invades people's privacy on a daily basis and technology that is so incredibly misused by law enforcement everywhere around the world by governments and oftentimes really deliberately targeting journalists, human rights advocates and marginalized communities and at border control and in prisons. And I mean, there's just so many implications to the misuses of this technology. And what floors me is 
sometimes the investors don't even hide it. You go to their portfolio and it's it's there. And they say that we're proud and we participated in the second round and in this third round. And we just want to put more and more money towards this because it's highly profitable. So you really see just how far we've come in terms of the surveillance capitalism that sometimes, yes, it's hidden in terms of just how much they get away with, but it's also become so incredibly normal for the industry, especially the venture capital industry all around the world. It's not just a lot of the time people would think it's just the US, but a lot of the times it's also the investment arms of actual governments throughout Southwest Asia, throughout Europe, throughout just so many different places that you really wonder, how can this actually even be legal? A lot of the times. So it has just completely shocked me because I shouldn't be shocked, as I mentioned. But as we're gathering this information, we actually didn't even notice until we visualized it because before it was just a giant data sheet. So if you become almost desensitized yourself because you're just opening this sheet and you're plugging in information and you're doing the research and you're kind of stuck into this rabbit hole. But when you visualize it, it's really when we started actually mocking up the platform that we noticed, okay, this is completely unacceptable and it's terrifying, but it's also in a sense humiliating because it just goes to show how little the entire world has stopped caring about surveillance and stopped caring about privacy rights. And what I really want people to understand is that this should force us into action more than ever. Why we got to where we are is because we have ourselves as users gradually normalized so much of this. And we see more and more of this happening today when you have to manually across so many different platforms go and have to go into personally your settings and figure out how do you stop, you know, access into AI and access into this and just every single footprint that we leave, we have to go through so much in order to undo a lot of the harms that these companies are committing. An everyday internet user, by the second you log in, it's just so much data that you're already given up. And that data is being weaponized against us in ways that are just, again, completely terrifying. And so it's really more important than ever that we start articulating and making clear that we cannot be complicit with our silence. We cannot be complicit with our acceptance, that it's really time for us to also explore legal paths, policies, global regulations that hold these companies and not just the com- these companies, but the many, many investors that are profiting off of them fully accountable for what I do consider to be actual rights violations, not just digital rights violations, because we truly see how this technology is impacting people's lives offline as well. I think because the realm of digital surveillance is so abstract, people don't quite understand the effect that it has on their lives. They don't understand why they should care about this. But as you mentioned, the consequences of this level of invasiveness into our lives is terrifying. Can you help paint a picture of some of the terrifying use cases of this data and why people should be concerned that it's all being collected? So a lot of people say, oh, why would I care? I mean, it's convenient. I have the algorithm. Everything knows what I like already. I don't have anything to hide. We are now being preconditioned constantly by all this technology creators, the funders, and everybody who's complicit to basically say that actually this is innovation and it's not. And we see how with artificial intelligence, so many of the companies that we feature are enhanced by AI in terms of how they gather information, how the information gets analyzed, how it gets applied to facial recognition and biometrics data. And we're told this is great. We should be proud that we have come so far that we have access to all of this brilliant technology. But once again, you put yourself in a situation where maybe the government that you have now is not going to be the same and you're not going to feel very safe. Maybe you're a queer person. Maybe you have certain political ideologies that you have spent years amplifying online that tomorrow might be illegal, considered criminal content. That's one of the issues that people don't understand that 
the fact that they're comfortable today, tomorrow might be a completely different story. One of the main things that could happen is, for example, again, you know, you have somebody in power that will say that your very identity is now considered a crime because of who you are, because of what you believe in, because of your political ideals, because of whatever values, you know, that you may possess. And they don't even need to silence you or censor you from that point onwards, because all they have to do is go through the history of all the information that you have spent years and years presenting and painting a, a complete digital profile of what you like and who you are and who you talk to, your social graph, absolutely everything, your financial data. And so it becomes very clear who is going to be a target for sometimes literal assassination, which we see that a lot of AI powered surveillance uh, companies are fully capable of. And in the way that so much of this is also getting into the hands of military uh, agencies, uh, intelligence agencies, law enforcement, again, to be weaponized against so many different communities. So that's what I would really want people to understand is so many people think, well, it doesn't relate to me because I'm not a criminal. Tomorrow you might be for reasons that you thought was completely impossible. But that's the reality that we live in today. We live in a completely unpredictable world. And so we really think it's important for people to start exercising their rights for privacy to really make sure that they have very good digital security hygiene because they're protecting not just their current selves, but they're definitely protecting their future selves and they're protecting the communities that are directly around them, your family, your children, your siblings. The more you encourage people to take on these more privacy preserving measures of how they communicate with you, educating them on the consequences of not doing so can really help empower them to also protect themselves and their communities. So that's really a message that we're hoping to convey. Also through this platform, one of the biggest takeaways that we had was we had tons of people from around the world that came and said, hey, we are digital security practitioners and trainers and when we shared this website with so many people, we got record amounts of signups for people who want to know how to better protect themselves. So this is another positive thing that could come out of this type of amplification, because yes, sometimes we read this big story about NSO group and the lawsuits, and sometimes we read this big investigation about how this malware could impact your phone and read your even your encrypted messages and all these things. But, but they're so sporadic sometimes, and they're sort of sometimes spread far apart. And if you're not part of these communities, you don't have access to them. So the everyday user doesn't come across them. And it seems like it's not a big problem. So by collecting and curating all this information, we're saying that it is absolutely a problem for everybody, not just targeted individuals. And if you're not implicated today, again, you know, it could be something for the future that you really need to protect yourself. Yeah, I think that expanding people's horizons of, of what's possible is is important here. And you talked about not being so fixated on the moment, but understanding that this implies to everything in the future too, you know, regimes come and go. We need to just kind of broaden our scope of the threats that could potentially affect us. I think another consideration is just coming to terms with this new age of digital permanence. I'm not sure that the human psyche has really kept up with this idea of permanence because we're used to having artifacts from our childhood. Maybe it was a handwritten note, but over the years, maybe it fades or we lose it or it gets destroyed. And so we're used to things coming and going. We're used to this transience of life but we've entered a new era of permanence where everything we do is added to a permanent record associated with our identity. And so people haven't quite come to terms with this, in my opinion, because they're not understanding that it's not just about the foreseeable future. Like, can I predict anything about 50 years from now, 70 years from now? You know, when we're talking about the permanence of data, we're talking about children who you know, are five today. And then when they're 95, what kind of a regime is in power who are going to get access to every single thing that that child has done throughout their entire life? And the enormity of that kind of comes into focus because they have digital permanence now that we've translated our lives to the digital age. And I think that the human brain maybe can't quite come to terms with that yet. 
I mean, it's a completely shocking in a way that we haven't come to terms with that because sometimes you really see, oh, you know, this is very clear what is happening. But again, you really, when you, the more people you speak with, the more you see that they don't really sense that this is kind of what's going on. You know, a lot of the people, they're talking about certain things such as, of course, other important things like addiction and all these kinds of things. But again, I mean, the more time you spend on a wide range of applications, the more data they're collecting about you. And the more, it's not just about profit, but a lot of the time it's control. Because then you see, you go to these transparency reports and you see the takedown request from a wide range of governments. And then you wonder, are you ever implicated? Sometimes your content is taken down and then you realize that, oh, it's because it was a, through government takedown request. And it just shows you the amount of control through just so many different angles, through corporations, through investors, through the creators of these technologies, through the hackers, actually, that might gain access to this data. So it's regardless of whether or not it's about just, oh, these certain companies are evil. A lot of the times, it's also, for example, advertising companies and whatnot, they have an obscene amount of data about our browsing habits, about our purchasing habits, about so much information tied to a single individual, geolocation data. And that is terrifying information to have in the wrong hands. And often they do fall in the wrong hands because they collect that information. So then they are either required to share that through a, a, a subpoena or oftentimes through a hacker or even a disgruntled employee that is using it to stalk certain users and cause all kinds of uh, legal issues. So it's also about psychologically, we, so many of us are suppressing our voices. I, for example, I have not posted pictures of myself online since I started using the web because I, I had the sense that there's something deeply wrong that's going to happen. So 20 plus years ago, it was very clear that this was the direction that the web was going to go in. And I just decided to be physically anonymous on the web. But it became a point where I couldn't also be anonymous, you know, not share my voice. I couldn't not share my name. I couldn't share so much of my information in order for me to even just use certain um, platforms or, for example, to fundraise for some of my initiatives or to do things that I absolutely need to do, like online banking and all these kinds of things that require you, you know, to give up, again, an obscene amount of personal data. But I had to be super selective with what I share, and I'm very glad that I did that, but so many people don't have that privilege anymore because they feel it's too late. There's so much information about them that was already curated. But for those individuals, it's about changing your habits today. We, it's really hard to go back and kind of undo a lot of what you shared, but it is possible to really be more conscious about just how you experience the web. And 20 years ago, we didn't have a lot of privacy preserving technology that we have access to today. End-to-end -end encryption wasn't as widely accessible as it is today. It's about the choices we make. And the more choices we make that are more privacy preserving, more businesses can actually go towards that and know that there's an opportunity, for example, maybe pay to use the service if you're able to, in exchange for not sharing your, your data in general, making sure you use platforms that do not track their users, that don't have ad targeting, that um, really make sure to, at, at the very least, anonymize some of the user data. It's very difficult, but it is completely possible, and it's actually becoming increasingly possible to do that. And maybe in that sense, for people who have younger children that are now beginning to use the web, making sure they're also heading towards that direction so that this idea of the digital permanence can at least not prevent them from also being able to be their authentic selves online, which is very important because so many of the people around me, so much of my immediate uh, community, especially in a country like my own, where surveillance is completely the norm, it is becoming more and more acceptable for people to, once they start using these uh, privacy preserving technologies, to really just be themselves without fear, at least online. And that is saying a lot because we already have a fear of being ourselves offline due to all kinds of repression around us. So sometimes people use online platforms as 
the only safe haven they really have to gather, to talk about things that we're not able to talk about in our everyday lives and in our immediate communities, to be able to bypass censorship, and now to be able to bypass uh, surveillance, at least to an extent, there's no way for us to be completely safe. Because again, we're, we have to unfortunately, give up so much of our data to use just the most common basic facilities, we absolutely cannot just accept that this is going to be our future. And we have to push back on so many of these, especially AI companies that are saying, hey, you know, for your convenience and for the sake of better productivity, give up all your data, we'll track all your data, it'll make you be more productive, it'll, it'll help you find things better online. And we need to really make sure that people understand that this is not what it really is, that this is actually a very dangerous precedent that these companies have set that it's our responsibility to not just push back on it in our personal capacity, but to educate others in what is wrong with this model and why we need to stand up against this surveillance capitalist model. I've noticed there's this sort of paradox that a lot of people currently have in their relationship with privacy. And it's it's kind of insidious. It reminds me of this Orwellian doublespeak that we can hold these two conflicting thoughts in our head at the same time and believe them both to be true. Because I noticed that people simultaneously assume that they have privacy in a lot of their interactions online. And then they also pronounce that they don't care whether or not they have privacy. I interpret this as a justification. You know, humans have this interesting biological quirk where we need to justify our actions. We do things and then we make up reasons why we did it uh, in order to make ourselves feel good about decisions that we've made. And so we assume that we have privacy. So we do a lot of things under the basic presumption that, well, companies are treating us fairly and governments are treating us fairly and they're not being super invasive because that would be awful. A lot of people in their private DMs, there's no way that they would say some of the things or send some of the photos or videos that they do unless they presumed that they had privacy when doing it. And they kind of don't understand that that privacy isn't there. But then when you tell them, yes, everything is being collected. Yes, your text messages are not only being collected, but they're being cataloged and analyzed. And there's ML training that's being used on them to infer even more sensitive information about you. And when you tell people this, their response almost becomes defensive. Well, I don't care anyway. You know, I have nothing to hide. We simultaneously have become complacent about all of this while also being completely unaware about what's actually going on. Yeah. And I mean, this is such a common reaction that we often see. In my context, at least the good thing is that we get to say that by you choosing to DM me this information, you're actually risking my life. Yeah, And that has been a powerful way for us to really make sure that people start thinking about other people and not just themselves. Who are they DMing this information to? Maybe they're implicating somebody else in something that they really shouldn't be, especially in a political context, for example. So in my community, at least that has really helped in spreading awareness because we always try to tell people that, hey, you emailed me certain information that I would really much rather you used signal for or something else for. So this really encourages people to at least be mindful. And now more than ever, I have started noticing at least people, especially journalists sometimes reach out and say, what is your preferred method for engagement? What is the best way for me to reach out to you that you think would be safe? And by the way, here are some options that we would recommend as a news agency and so on and so forth. Mm. This didn't used to happen. Sometimes years ago, I would get text messages from journalists asking me very intimate questions that I would rather they not. Um, because of the amount of surveillance we have, especially from our, our telecom companies that is directly controlled by, by our government. So for me, it at least it has been very eye-opening to see, okay, people are now being trained at least 
to start understanding, okay, this is how you're implicating other people. If you're a journalist, you obviously have to protect your sources, but you also have to make sure that your sources are alive, you know, after um, interviewing them or after sharing something that they've done, or maybe that person wanted to be anonymous and you just completely de-anonymize them by sending them this information through that method. But again, that is not widespread. That's not the same reaction you get from your cousin. It's not the same reaction you would get from your colleague at work or somewhere else. So it is really important, again, to just share that it's not just about you. And I think there's just a lot of this type of selfishness, unfortunately, that I've noticed with a lot of these people who say, well, I don't care. You know, I enjoy the content on TikTok and this and that, and I want to share it through this way. And I want to do this and I want to do that. And again, I don't care. And they should, you know, because it's your social graph that's paying the price. It's not just you. It's never been about just you. It's the people you engage on a daily basis that you're also um, implicating in this. And maybe they themselves are not aware. So it creates this domino effect of, okay, one person chose not to be private and now everybody in their immediate community is also not private because this person now only chooses to communicate this way and that has become normalized. What makes it so important when people say, well, there's only so much that I can do. There's actually a lot that every single person can do. I mean, you can say that this is the only way you can reach me if you want to, and slowly now people are downloading these apps and starting to understand, okay, if I want to reach certain people, this is how, and it's becoming more and more people that are saying, okay, these are the ways that you have to respect communicating with me. These are the boundaries and these are the things that I will allow on these communication platform and the things that I will not. And then simply not using the platforms that are repeatedly um, infringing on your rights, basically, and just not having a presence um, in some of those really helps as well. So I just want to talk about this chilling effect of understanding that we have pervasive surveillance in our lives, mm -hmm. and that has subconscious uh, psychological implications. We start to self-censor, we start to tread on eggshells, and I think most of us don't even realize that we're doing it. But it's hard not to be aware of all of the surveillance around us. You know, the computer whose microphone could be turned on at any time, the Alexa sitting there, the apps that are constantly streaming out metadata about all of our interactions. We start to internalize all of this surveillance, and I think it does have psychological effects on how authentic we are and how honest we are in our opinions. I just want to kind of explore that and talk about like, what are the consequences of that kind of repression in society? I absolutely self-censor myself a lot more than I should. I mean, sometimes I just see somebody wearing a smartwatch and then just thinking to myself, well, I don't know if I should be really talking about what I would want to talk about in the presence of such a device. My case is a little bit more extreme because I deal with very sensitive human rights issues on in my daily life and in my daily work and in the communities that I work with and try to protect. But it has impacted many, many other things. For example, I wouldn't share certain information about my childhood or my family around people that I would say are lovers of gadgets, you know, because I just increasingly, you just don't understand, okay, well, I don't know when this might turn on. And now we have all these wearable technologies that is also terrifying because it's always like, oh, do you want to remember the conversation you had yesterday? Well, here's a recap, you know, and you can now share everything or a transcript of everything that you, you, that you discuss with this person. That terrifies me. I do not want to live in a future where something like this is normal. Because again, it means that there's so much about myself that I can't share for security reasons because of my daily work. And that could mean just even just the simplest things, where I went to school, the people I went to school with, because all of these can be used against me if I did something in the future or if some of my work were to come out, the things that I have chosen to do anonymously linked to my identity or just... There's so much of my life I have kept private. Keeping so much of yourself hidden and secret and private also has 
drastic psychological effects because it creates the sense of isolation and loneliness that you never really felt that you had when you felt that you had a bit more liberty to talk about the things again that you want to talk about or talk to the people you want to talk to without feeling like there's something or someone listening at all times. So it's not just about the things that we communicate online, but now because of so much of this has become wearable and just listening and the microphones and all this, you just feel the sense of obligation to be more private in every aspect of your life. And myself, I mean, I considered myself at least to be very creative. One of the platforms that we build is for underground musicians. We work a lot with musicians, specifically independent artists and whatnot. We work with illustrators, with animators. And I just feel the creative part of me has completely died with this increasing of privacy. I just, I don't feel like I can embrace my creative side anymore because I'm scared that it might reveal certain information about me and might reveal some of the artists that I've worked with on very sensitive projects. It has just felt like a very, very lonely experience. And you see this with others as well. You see, people are not connecting the way they used to. They're not using platforms. They're very, very selective about which platforms they do use. So now you have all of these very separate communities that are very closed off because they were very distrusting of just anybody else. And so you're going and you're trying to find the communities that are in a sense of belonging, and it's just not there because everybody feels, okay, well, you know, this person, well, we're not sure what they bring. This person has a presence on that platform, and that means that they are complicit. This person uses AI, and therefore they're this and that. And so you also see this sort of judgment about the tools that people are using and then you connect that with okay if you're not privacy conscious then you're not welcome in my community and you see just so much division happening the division we're happening is not just happening on a cultural or political level but it's really happening on a privacy level as well people saying that if you're not using these private tools, you're not going to talk to me at all. And so again, you are losing. I mean, for me, I had to set that boundary for certain people, but it has meant that I have lost sometimes friendships, not because they're angry, you know, that I've chosen this path, but because they can't be bothered installing these other ways, you know, to communicate with me. And for me, it's a compromise. I don't want to adopt the tools that they're using because I feel it's completely unsafe. Even if the relationship I have with that person has nothing to do with my human rights work, I just do not want access to that, an application that is going to track my location, my data, my everything connected to me, my social graph and so on. So it has such a huge effect on your relationships and the way you see the world, but also the way you express yourself to the world completely changes. How do you explain this big chasm of understanding between you and the average person? Because you're telling me about how you're constantly aware of the smart devices around you, how you have strong boundaries when it comes to communication platforms that you use, how you are terrified for the future and a world where we have this digital permanence and invasive tracking in all parts of our lives. But then you look at the average person out there who professes they have nothing to hide And there's just such a wide divide between these two stances, one person being terrified and one person just exhibiting complete complacency. And part of me thinks it's honestly just the fact that most people aren't exposed to the consequences of this surveillance, whereas you work in a very dangerous field. And so just the fact that you are in constant contact with the dangers, you're well aware of how vulnerable you are. That just makes you better educated about this. And until someone is in a similar situation, they might just not ever truly understand the consequences of pervasive surveillance. Would you say that that's correct, that it's just a matter of exposure and that the average person, in order to become impassioned about this topic, they need to be personally affected somehow? 
I think, unfortunately, that's the current framing that is obvious to people because they see me, they say, well, it makes sense for you because you do human rights advocacy. And yes, you need to take all these precautions, but I'm a banker and I don't care. I, again, you know, there's nothing for me to be scared of. So for me, the biggest challenge has been trying to express to people that this is not just about paranoia because of the type of work that I do. Or the fact that I have to be more secure because, again, the, the type of communities that I need to protect as well. I really want people to wake up to the reality that this data is being weaponized against absolutely everyone. You might be implicated in a crime that you didn't even commit because a hacker, you know, took advantage of your biometrics data and your information and put you on a scene of a crime because this data is just everywhere and we're willingly just giving it away. Or the fact that AI gets so much wrong and facial recognition software enhanced by AI and so on gets so much wrong. And we have plenty of data that is pointing this fact out, but it doesn't seem to concern people when they're using, you know, facial recognition willingly and giving up all that information and not really participating in advocacy campaigns and demands to push back on this, to push back on the requirements of all of this, especially when, you know, you're talking about travel and tomorrow you might not have access to certain things, you know, because they think, oh, this person is not going to be allowed into this country for this or that reason. And you're giving up so much control, so much that Again, it has very little to do with your day job. It has very little to do with the fact that whether or not you have something to hide. And it has everything to do with that you should have control over who you are as an individual, over your data, over your likes, over your dislikes, over your political opinions, over the things that should belong to you, because these are the things that make us unique when it's all information that's just spread out there. And it's just making it very possible to suppress somebody, to censor somebody, to surveil somebody. It's making it easy for everybody, not just law enforcement, but again, it comes to people who want to misuse this technology, disgruntled employees of a company that gathers this data, wanting to put this information on the dark web for somebody else to come and do something even worse with it. It is really resulting in also a lot of cybersecurity situations. It can implicate your bank account. It could implicate the things you have access to. It could implicate being locked out of the accounts that you've had so many years, your email, your personal data, that your relationships, your art in some cases, your music, your... So for me, I'm tr I try my best when I speak to people who are not immediately or cannot relate to my struggles to really paint this picture about, do you want to be listened to in your car now that we have so many patents that are being applied to Bluetooth tracking technologies in your car and your multimedia devices and your phone and just being able to, everywhere you go, you wanna be tracked, your license plate number, where you went, your vehicle information, where you travel to. So I try to paint a picture of, again, that this is a future where everybody, not just law enforcement and governments, but literally everybody will know everything about you or can know everything about you and weaponize this information against you. The scale of the human rights abuses just sees no end. Because if you're somebody who's from a marginalized community or a targeted community or an immigrant community or people who are being oppressed, Today, I mean, this information becomes even much more of a nightmare. And again, it brings us back to the situation that maybe tomorrow you might be a part of those types of communities as, as well because of what you believe. So really trying to zoom out as much as possible to say that this is not a few people type threat, that this should threaten everyone. If you actually see so many of the companies that are featured on Surveillance Watch, a lot of them are not just targeting human rights defender journalists and whatnot. They're targeting absolutely everyone and drawing conclusions from AI software and big data analysis and whatnot. And we're implicated, every single person is implicated regardless of who you are or how privileged you think you might be or how, or how above the law you might even think you are because of your wealth or your network or who you are and so on. Absolutely nobody is immune to what's happening. 
And there's also, I think, a division to be made between privacy that I enjoy and the principle of privacy. Just because something doesn't personally affect me, I can understand the principle. When it comes to privacy, I may not feel that I'm important or threatened or that this is something I should worry about, but all it takes is just zooming out to a global scale and you understand how important privacy is as a matter of life and death for people all over the globe. So it seems very naive to dismiss privacy as unimportant as a concept, simply because you do not feel the necessity for it in your privileged life. And I think that's a mistake a lot of people fall into. They're just really thinking about their position and whether they should care about something. But we need to reframe this and understand that surveillance is an incredibly powerful tool that is used to oppress some of the most vulnerable people in the world. And we should not be okay with it out of principle, simply because we are feeling like we have a sheltered life. Exactly, exactly. There's one other thing. So when it comes to governments, a lot of people feel very happy with their government and uh, companies as well. They have a lot of trust in the companies around them. But one way that we can re reframe this is to remind people that governments and corporations are not monolithic entities. They're made up of humans and humans can be corrupted. So when we're talking about all powerful technologies in the hands of powerful entities and then people within those entities becoming corrupted and abusing that power, I think that helps to remind people of why this power should be treated with caution in the first place. Because we're always going to come across people who are corrupted, politicians who are corrupted and, and use tools to their advantage, business people who are corrupted, average people who are corrupted. It, it's something that just happens. And so we tend to only think of this powerful technology in the hands of people we really trust. Oh, well, my, my preferred leader is in power, therefore I feel okay with this technology. But at any time, this technology is accessible to people who are not looking out for our best interests, who are, you know, bad actors, who are trying to hurt people. And we need to also remember that, that when we create these tools, we can't safeguard them and guarantee they will only ever be used by good people. Exactly right. And one of the things is for governments in particular, there are so many agencies that are often implicated. It's never just, oh, the government itself, I agree with their policies and therefore they cannot possibly be doing anything terrible with my data. Because when we then go see how so many former NSA operatives are actually working with highly repressive regimes around the world and how the US government itself, you know, sometimes is using the data in ways that are completely reckless and dangerous and irresponsible, but actually even criminal. So for people to think, oh, I mean, it's just about the government and whoever's in it, the administration and, and so on, it never really ends there. Sometimes people come into power, but the same heads of agencies and a lot of the staffers remain the same. And they're using this data in ways that are just completely unethical and dangerous. So. That's an important thing to keep in mind as well, because it's the same way that companies operate. You have the VPs and you have, you know, just so many different levels within companies where their incentives may not be aligned with your values. Even if the incentive is to make profit, sometimes that means that they have to do really terrible things to achieve that profit. And they often do. So it's important to understand the consequences of what happens when you willingly give up your data and it will fall in the wrong hands. It's not a matter of when, but it's a matter of how often. Yeah, that's a, that's a great point. I mean, I think this tool that you've created is incredible. I think people should play around with it, start clicking on links, look at the sources that you've listed there so that they can get a better understanding of how invasive all this tracking is, how many companies exist that are doing this. I mean, this is just a handful of them, right? This isn't a comprehensive exactly. list. This is just the ones that, some of the ones that we know about. And there are so many more shady shell companies out there that we've never even heard of that are you know, doing even more invasive things into our life. And so it's important that people just start to 
wrap their heads around this, play around on this website, click on different countries and say which countries are behind which which companies and which other countries they're selling this data to. This is a global problem and not everyone is looking out for your best interests. So understand how all this information might be used for someone's agenda who is not looking out for your best interests. I think it's, it's just such a great tool you've created. Thank you so much. Yes. And we're definitely only going to grow from here. So we want to encourage people. There's a submit button. If there's a company that we didn't feature, company that you want our reviewers to kind of look at, please feel free to submit information. We really rely on a lot of user submissions to curate and correct and continue to expand on this data. And then we're also making it easier to access this website through some more privacy preserving browsers because we had limited resources in building this, but we are in the process of making significant improvements in terms of the accessibility of this data. We're also in the process of building an API for others to build on this data in different types of visualizations or ways. So it's definitely also just a start for us. So it may be just a start to the research in terms of just how much more we need to get done, but we also are relying on our community, you know, to support us in growing this resource and and hopefully keeping it online. It's an incredible resource. Uh, I hope that people do come here, submit, support what you're doing. And just this awareness, as you said, this is the tip of the iceberg and we're only starting to understand how deep all of this goes. And it's so important to map this out in a way that people can clearly understand so they can truly internalize the impact of it all. So thanks for starting this and I look forward to see where it goes. Thank you for helping us spread the word. Really appreciate it.